Mazzella here again for Small Business Digest, and we certainly have an interesting guest today. He he deals with something that a lot of us deal with, but a few of us understand, which is insurance and how to protect yourself. But in in his uh, particular case, it's the hospitality industry, which is going through, uh, as we can all know, and it, Interesting times, if not difficult times. David DiLorenzo, welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, David, first, tell us a little bit about your personal background, then about what your company does, and and finally, a website for people. Okay. Yeah, so my personal background, um, I grew up in Arizona, graduated from ASU. I started... Uh, my first job at Warner Brother Records, working for some of the biggest uh, artists uh, that most people would be familiar with. Everybody from Van Halen to Aerosmith, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Madonna. Those were all, let's just say, artists that I got to work uh, hand in hand with in, in the ripe, you know, young years of 20 something. And I was living out my passion. I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. I had always been, you know, very passionate about music, the music industry, didn't have enough talent to be a rock star. So I figured I would, uh, you know, work with rock stars. So I did that. And then Apple came out with iTunes and the music industry just, you know, plummeted. There wasn't the jobs, there wasn't the future. I, I just didn't see it coming. Um, and, and it was looking pretty grave. So I got into insurance and insurance wasn't just, uh, you know, let's shoot in the air and, and find something to do. Uh, insurance was something that, you know, my dad had started an, an agency and, and he has been in it until last year. He, I let him retire uh, for 50 years. So it was a family business that, you know, I ended up taking over. Um, and, and I just saw the potential in that. But with the potential of that, I saw you know, I saw a need and a necessity to, again, continue to live out my passion and also um, find an industry and find a niche being hospitality, bar and restaurant. Um, and so I started bar and restaurant insurance about 18 years ago. I bought the website and, you know, just went and went, dove in 100 percent into understanding the industry, uh, working in the industry. I've owned 13 restaurants. So, you know, to be able to speak the language of other people that are in the industry, but also understand, um, you know, very closely what's needed to protect them from certain claims and certain, you know, instances of things that can go wrong. So I started that niche and, you know, for the next 20 something years, that's what I've been doing. And, you know, it's ever evolving. It's always changing. There's always different types of risk. Obviously, you know, with the pandemic, there are a lot of questions about what's covered, you know, what's not covered. Um, but even prior to that and before that, depending on state laws and regulations, you know, there's all sorts of uh, questions that are always out there. And, you know, unfortunately, those questions are never asked, nor are they answered until a claim happens. And generally, it's too late. So I like to put a lot more into the educational process of helping people understand what it is that they're purchasing in the hopes, you know, for them and for the insurance carrier that it's not needed, but that if it is needed, they understand what they bought and that they're protected. So... Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. As it happened just recently, I, I ran to a woman who uh, does the underwriting for the hospitality industry bars. And, uh, and talking to her, I was really struck by how uh, the nuances of the industry. Um, can you give us a couple? Well, before we go into the pandemic, before that, can you give us some of the things that a, that a restaurant and a bar owner would face that uh, a, uh, a retail dress store would not face? Yeah, I mean, the, the number one thing when you're dealing with a bar or a restaurant that serves alcohol is your, is your liquor exposure. And again, it goes back, you know, every state um, has different laws. They're all different. But I can tell you for, you know, our home state of Arizona, we have some of the most um, let's just say vicious liquor laws there are towards the, you know, the establishments and you can, as a hospitality establishment, you can get sued for serving somebody one drink, which again, that's why you hold a liquor license. You're there to serve alcohol to adults that come in or are able to buy it. Unfortunately, if that person or persons 
uh, happened to get into an accident during the course of the night and you were the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth, or, you know, um, all the above, you can get pulled into what's called a dram shop lawsuit is what most people are familiar with here in the state of Arizona. And so, um, you know, specifically a lot of what I cover has to do with alcohol liability. And, you know, unfortunately in 20 years, I've seen a lot of death and I've seen a lot of claims that, um, you know, particularly are related to that. Now, not only that, you know, you obviously, you get into the slip and falls, you get people to get, <clears throat> excuse me, they get food poisoning. Um, you also get into fights, you know, in bars, you have what's called the salt and battery coverage. Um, you do have, you know, instances where people can get shot. Um, there is coverage, you know, that would take place in that if there is not an exclusion for it. Um, and, you know, you have your normal stuff like, you know, workers' compensation where, you know, that can be, you know, in a hospitality industry when you're cutting and dicing and cooking, you know, you're looking at burns and slips and cuts and, and all that sort of stuff. It can be, you know, a very big educational process for the restaurant owner to kind of understand that they really need to train their employees to not get hurt because that can have an adverse effect on their overall numbers, especially when it comes to having them, you know, covered insurance wise. Well, let's back up a little bit uh, because you mentioned one that's always fascinated me, which is if uh, someone drinks at your bar and walks out and kills someone, you could be th theoretically sued or may made partly responsible. Am I correct on that? In the state of Arizona specifically, yes, and, and yes, many other states as well. The thing about the state of Arizona is that there's no caps on limits, so you can sue for the moon, whereas, say, Chicago or Denver, there's a, a certain amount. It's like 100, 168,000, you know, per claim that has a cap on it, so you know, you know, what you're dealing with. Arizona, there's no cap on those limits. There's no tort reform when it comes to, you know, the attorneys being able to sue, and there's, there's no burden of proof whether that person was or was not overserved. Um, so what ends up happening is that the insurance company has to come in, defend on their dime to basically you're, you're guilty until proven innocent sort of situation out here. And that's, and that's why I'm kept very busy in Arizona. Well, uh, let's back up. How do you prove that you didn't uh, uh, s uh, serve a dr uh, guy that was obviously drunk? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of it just comes down to what was their bar tab? What do you have on video? You know, other key witnesses that were there. I, it, it's all of these data collection items that hopefully the hospitality and um, the, the restaurant and bars are able to do to the best of their ability and keeping that sort of information if and where, when they hear about an incident in the news or something that has happened. You can't by any human, you know, um, way, keep track of every person that walks into your place, you know, thinking that this could be the one. You just got to do the best that you can. And again, that's why insurance is so prevalent and comes to defend those if they do get in a situation like that. Well, what about the, uh, always having cameras in, in every location except obviously the bathroom? Yeah. Does that, does that mitigate anything? Yeah, it, it certainly does. I mean, we've had, I've seen a number of cases where, um, you know, cameras have been involved and plaintiff's attorneys have said one thing. And when we're defending, you know, our clients and we actually have, you know, basically proof that, you know, this person was only in the establishment for say so long or they were only, they can only be seen, you know, being served this many drinks or, um, you know, the, the, the fight or whatever it was, you know, didn't really go the way that it was, you know, basically um, transcribed, you know, to the, to the judge. So a, a number of times it can be very, very helpful. It can also, you know, come back to bite you um, in the aspect that if people erase that or let's just say they hold it, the plaintiff's counsel is eventually going to get a hold of it. They will always find it. They'll always get a hold of it through subpoenas, through the courts, this and that. And then what you have done is you've put the insurance company in a very bad place to defend you at that point because they just don't know, you know, what the truth is and what they are dealing with. Well, uh, I'm, I'm about to open a bar, restaurant, okay? I come to you. What are some of the questions I should be asking you and what are some of the questions you should be asking me in a situation like that? Yeah. Um, so I'm a novice in the industry. I know nothing about it. So assume that. 
Okay. So you're, you know, you're coming into it and, and, and really, you know, what you want to know from a liability standpoint is what coverages do I need? You know, what, what do I need to know in order to be protected? What are some of the things that I need to do? So, you know, again, I'll specifically speak to Arizona law, but this is pretty much, you know, United States, um, you know, broadened in, in most cases, you know, n number one, when you sign a lease, the lease is going to dictate the terms of what insurance coverage is that you, you know, that you need. So that's the number one thing before somebody gets involved and signs something and, you know, um, has a contractual lease with a landlord based on what insurance coverage is that landlord wants. You want to make sure you know and you understand and you have an insurance representative, somebody that at least knows insurance <clears throat> reviews that and states, you know, this coverage is going to be a burden for you, or this one's going to be $10,000 more than what, you know, you have budgeted for. And it seems to be a little excessive compared to what the market's at or what your neighbor is doing, you know, across the, uh, across the street. So a lot of that will come into play. Other questions that need to be asked are, you know, what are, you know, as a hospitality person, what are some of my exposures that, you know, I may not be thinking about? And that can, you know, that can be you know, basically the handling of, you know, hot pots and pans and or hot water, you know, stuff like that. I've, I've had a death claim where somebody was handling hot water and, and burnt themselves to third degree burns and just, you know, wasn't safe or careful with it. Um, other items that they need to know is about employees. I mean, right now, everybody's dealing with a shortage of employees or they're dealing with, uh, employees that may not be the most cooperative or think that they deserve, you know, more than they do, or they feel like they can control others in a work environment. And so you're running into an area of what's employment practice liability and employment practice liability is another insurance coverage that is not as broadly sold, but is becoming more and more popular now because, you know, people are getting sued for sexual harassment. They're getting sued for hiring and firing practices or for discrimination. And so that is a, you know, a very um, good coverage that could come into play to defend people, you know, on, on those sorts of issues and stuff like that. So, so that's, you know, the, the, the bars and, and taverns and restaurants, so those are all really the, the prevalent questions in the beginning. I, I think the other thing that they need to, you know, that I would ask them is how much property do you have? How much are you investing into your restaurant? When you're building this out and you shake the restaurant over, you know, on its, uh, on its uh, bottom and, and everything's going to fall out. How much is that? Is it 100,000, 200,000? We're talking pots, pans, tables, chairs, TVs. What do we need to insure you for as far as replacement costs? And then how much money did you put into construction to build this out, to make it nice and beautiful? How, you know, how much is your walk-in? How much is this nice luxurious bar that you built into somebody else's property? You know, what is that figure? So knowing those figures and ensuring, you know, the risk to 90 to 100 percent of what the insurable value is so that if and when, you know, or if there is a fire or let's say you have something that sets the sprinkler system off and the foam goes all over and it ruins everything. I've had those two, not necessarily a big fire, but something where the fire department comes in and just destroys everything. I've seen restaurants shut down after that. And they've gotten paid out on their business income and they got paid out on all the property that was in there because they had the adequate coverage for it. So those are a lot of the questions that I need to ask and, you know, some of the questions that they need to be asking me, you know, when they're first starting out. Your website again for people who want to know more? Mm -hmm. It's uh, very straightforward. So it's bar, B-A-R, and, and then the word restaurant. Um, I'm not going to try and spell that, but restaurant and then insurance.com. So bar and restaurant insurance.com is, you know, uh, my restaurant and, and bar website. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to ask a different question for the moment because uh, um, I, I have a bar restaurant um, and a, a car runs into the front, front of the restaurant and destroys the restaurant so I can't continue. Uh, and, the, and I have business interruption insurance, which I believe everybody should have, but that's my own preference. What do you think? And, and then, um, so how do you go about proving, you, you know, well, I did a thousand dollars a day and now I can't get up and run. I haven't been, I've been out of action for three months. Uh, the, the insurance companies, their, their favorite word is no. And then everything else follows. Uh, so I guess my first question is, how do you prove uh, uh, business interruption? And two, how do you get the insurance company to do something about it? 
Yeah, look, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, you know, being a broker, I see a multitude of insurance companies. Some are not that good and some are great. And, you know, my goal and job is to always represent the best of the best and establish relationships with those because for me, it's always the client first, you know, and, and then it's also being as, eth as ethical, the most ethical as possible and making sure that I'm representing to the insurance company who or what that client is. So when you run into a situation like that car runs through the front, let's just say the, the, the establishment's been open for a multitude of years, they're going to have data based on those, you know, those years, those days, how much they did in sales, what their expenses are. I mean, they need to have all that data. You're running a business. So at the end of the day, it's not illogical for an insurance company to ask for that stuff. It is a little bit of a, and I don't care what insurance company this is or whatever it is, they want to see the paperwork and they want to get an understanding of how much is really lost, you know, to just so that neither party is getting ripped off in that essence. So it's, it's just some backdating accounting of what occurs there. And then yes, you know, they're going to pay to have the front repaired, whatever damage to the, uh, um, you know, let's just say the host table. I just had one of these claims, actually the host table, um, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And then during the time that they're down, they're going to pay for a multitude of expenses and, and payroll and, and stuff like that. If it is, you know, adequately covered under that basis. Now they're just open and, you know, they don't have that history or that track record. Um, you know, that's going to be something that an adjuster is really going to have to sit down with the insured and just kind of go over projections and, you know, other type businesses in the area and, and what the multitude of receipts are and, and really kind of figure that out. I will specifically say um, I haven't experienced one of those claims in 22 years as far as somebody just opening up and then being shut down right away. It's not really anybody's goal. And, and thank goodness in Arizona, we don't have a lot of weather related stuff or anything like that. Um, so you know, I leave that for the, the actuaries and the, and the claims adjusters and pretty much hear about stuff if there's a problem. And then I, I do like to get involved. But what if the insurance company, and, and uh, I happen to know a different case, what if the insurance company just is just letting the thing uh, ride? They, you know, the, the person submits all the claims and everything and the insurance company said, no, and um how how does uh, does the restaurant owner uh, get get uh, the insurance company to act? Should they find a, an independent adjuster? Mm -hmm. What should they do? Yeah, I, I have a I have a whole um, two or three independent adjusters that I trust, know, and and they're, they're good people. They're not you know your your normal ambulance chasing you know just grabbing for money. So. Um, Any time that I feel that the insurance company is in the wrong, I will refer my client over to a public adjuster who will go through policy form in more detail than you know what I'm capable of doing because of them having the the, the pedigree to do that sort of stuff. And they will then go after the insurance carrier and they'll do what they need to do to collect the money and they'll take a little bit you know off the top for the service. How much do they usually charge? You know, about twenty percent of whatever the total payout is about 20 percent yeah well well let me uh uh this is fascinating because um uh i we run into the, the company the big companies the insurance companies do for you know they just uh let you hang there rather than pay better they have the money in their pocket than your pocket mm -hmm. uh, you know the, it's a really interesting uh but let's let's move on the pandemic has changed everything. What are some of the changes that you've seen that people should should know about in the terms of uh, uh, what insurance they should have and what are the things they should be doing? You, you mentioned harassment is really uh, a, a bigger area. What are some of the areas that are changing? Yeah, look, the, the pandemic was, a, um, was, is, however you want to clarify it, you know, a very scary and sad thing. And a lot of restaurants and hospitality shut down, you know, because of it and many facets of the reason of why that because is, you know, it, it is what it is. You know, as far as because of it and what you should change or what you should concentrate on your insurance coverage, really nothing, nothing's changed in the insurance world as far as, you know, the, the liquor liability, the general liability that, I mean, people are going out 
I'll speak in Arizona more than ever out here. My, my restaurants are, you know, my clients are dominating. They're doing an amazing job and, and people want to go out and they want to be, you know, in a community. I guess to go back to, you know, what I had originally said and what you just, you know, brought up, uh, because we are, you know, living in, you know, not just during the pandemic, we're dealing with a with a disease. We're also dealing with a culture, a different, you know, set or mindset of that culture. And so that's where I really believe the employment practices, which is actually getting harder to get, you know, I mean, higher deductibles and different limits or whatever, but it's still a good conversation to have uh, with, the, you know, with my client, um, you know, about because, we're just seeing more and more of that, uh, let's just say, woke responsibility in those in those lawsuits. So, but uh, here in New Jersey and uh, New York, it's my understanding that um, uh, insurance company, if a if a restaurant's closed because of a pandemic, insurance companies are saying, "Tough luck, uh, we're not paying you for business interruption." Is that happening in other parts of the country? Well, I, I I wouldn't say tough luck. I would say read your insurance policy. I mean, it's it's plainly written in the contract that virus and bacteria is excluded and business income is a physical damage coverage. Now, look, I'm not an advocate for the insurance company. I'm just a practicality person. And in the last you know two and a half years, not a single restaurant in the United States or the world that I know of, I could be totally wrong, but nothing that I have read has been awarded business income based on virus or bacteria. It just hasn't happened. So you know, the government needed to intercede, which they did. And they came out with what was called PPP loans and employee retention credit out here. And a lot of restaurants are actually better off than where they were before the, you know, the pandemic. So, you know, I not saying that you're doing this, but to put all the blame on the insurance industry, if they had to pay out business income on every single business that had shut down, there would be no more insurance industry and the whole American economy would just go down. That was just not the intention um, for something that is so unpredictable has a, you know, has a pandemic with a virus or whatever. I couldn't, have, I understand that, but uh, uh, the, the, I say it's interesting. You say, uh, 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 restaurants are doing well. But it, it's uh, what we see here in the, in the Northeast, and what I've seen from from other shows that I've done. Yeah, that a lot of re, a lot of restaurants simply haven't had the the financial wherewithal uh, to survive being shut down three and, to twenty six weeks, depending. Um, and yeah. Uh, that 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 makes me very sad. I mean, honestly, I love New York. My dad's from Jersey. You know, I was married in New York. And, you know, to hear that these places are going out of business due to being shut down and not getting the financial support, support it, it is very sad. So please, if you're listening, understand this comes from, you know, my very small, um, let's just say, area of Arizona. And, you know, we have done very well out here due to the way, you know, let's just say the dice were rolled. So I, I do have a, you know, a very soft heart for New York and, and some of these other states where that is going on because yeah you're right that is a reality of what's going on and unfortunately there's some classic restaurants I mean just beautiful places that had to shut down because they couldn't survive and they're not getting the support from the government or the other programs that they deserve to get. Well the problem seems to be that if you if you didn't have an in you didn't get the money. Right. I mean you know that, that that's the interesting part but but we're here to talk about your com company. Um, and uh, uh, what do you see as the future of, uh, uh, do you see many changes in the way people uh, insure themselves in the, in the industry? I, I, I see less employees down the road. Um, you know, I will say that there is a labor shortage, but not a shortage of people. Um, but you're going to find a lot of these restaurant tours that are successful and were able to, you know, uh, venture on and, and, and outlast this. They're, they're looking at the way that they operate and they're looking for the ease of doing business. And they're, and they're listening to the response of what, you know, the younger generation, a lot of these people want to do. And, and 
you know, a lot of times they just want to take their food and go, or they want to, you know, be brought to their house. I mean, you know, where you and I would like to go sit down and have a steak and a nice glass of wine and enjoy an ambiance for, you know, a couple of hours with friends. I, you know, I, I have a 17 and a, um, you know, a 20 year old, and that's just not the, you know, not necessarily the case with them as, as frequently as we like to do it. So yes, a lot of them are going to, they're going to, you know, shorten their footprint a little bit. They're, um, you know, probably gonna, uh, like I said, cut down on their labor force. And then as far as, you know, um, you know, food items and food quality that, that, you know, that's yet to be determined. You're probably going to see trends in, in a lot of this fake meat stuff because of the, you know, affordability of it. And because, you know, people are starting to get into that bandwagon and what's going on. So it's going to be interesting, but there's still going to be places for you and me to go to those, those old schoolers will still be around. <laughs> I hope so. What, um, what about robot robotics? Uh, uh, do you see, uh, do you see changes coming in uh, more robotic applications like that the place in Boston where you where the robots do the uh, ham, hamburgers? Uh, do you see that, and do you see a need for insurance in that area? Um, you know, that's a great question, and really not anything that's on my radar because. I don't believe that there is a single facility in Arizona where I like to, you know, alert most of my attention to that that is even, you know, um, a, a reality yet. And and not to say that it won't be. Maybe in the next five, ten years, you might see, you know, a few more of those places. But I'm still a true believer in the human aspect and the fact that you know people want to come in and be served. It's it's kind of like when you call. Um, you know, one of your personal vendors and you're on hold for 45 minutes, you know, I mean, it's just absolutely aggravating. So, you know, a lot of times we'd like to go to a restaurant and kind of feel that sense of community and that human touch and that, you know, um, you know, that that vibe that makes us human again. And, and so I, 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 you know, yeah, I, th that sort of stuff's going to come around. But, you know, as far as, um, you know, insuring it and any liabilities on it, uh, you're just looking at an aspect of probably different insurances as far as, you know, mm -hmm. mechanical breakdown and, you know, ensuring the, the, the robotics, you know, properly for the way it is. And then certain, you know, um, you know, endorsements in the policy about how the robotics operate and why and when and all that. So, yeah, you're, you're going to see a lot of different, you know, trans, transcripts and different things happen as things change and has it, you know, has it evolved. It's just kind of like Uber and Uber Eats. I mean, that wasn't around, you know, except for a handful of years now and you know insurance had to they had to figure out how to really ensure that you're just sending out a bunch of random people in their car to deliver food for you know places so then at that point who's responsible is it the restaurant is it the, the man or woman driving the food that's you know smoking a joint while they're you know driving <laughs> food yet the restaurant can't so you know you just have to you have to go with the flow and kind of figure those things out as they go along but the good news is I'm not the insurance company. I don't have to figure that out. I just have to keep in tune with the times and then, you know, find the right carriers for the, you know, for the risk that I'm um, looking at insuring. Okay. We have just a couple of minutes left. What would you like to leave our audience with? And will you tell us your website one more time? You bet. Um, so, you know, for, for me, again, insurance is, uh, wasn't necessarily my passion to begin with. My passion is people. My passion is community. My passion is hospitality. Insurance happens to be the byproduct of, you know, something that allows me to support this vehicle. And albeit I do get into insurance and I love to learn about it and I love to be, you know, um, you, you know, try to be always the best in my field and the most knowledgeable. And that's why I niched myself into one industry. There's so much insurance out there so many industries from construction to beauty to apartments to you name it and they all have their different tangents of things that you really got to pay attention to and know about and you know i'm just really happy to be into something that you know for me is fun i can wear i can wear a hoodie and jeans to my clients and i don't have to you know do the suit and tie thing and 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 they look at me as one of them as being a restaurant owner and doing all that so it's a very enjoyable experience you know for me, I love to, you know, speak. I love to help others. I, I just love to, you know, be a part of life in the hospitality end of it. And then again, my, you know, my website is barandrestaurantinsurance.com. You know, I go by the, the D-Lo. My last name is D-Lorenzo, but everybody calls me D-Lo. I have a podcast called 
on the DLO. And we do speak to hospitality people out here and, you know, it can be found anywhere where you can find me. So. Well, well on that note, David DeLorenzo, we say thank you for a very informative time.